All right, guys, so finally we're getting ready to talk about the last portion of the IC module, and that's the detectors. Good news for you, there's not too much information in this section, so we are almost finished. I, literally, you're probably looking at one or two videos on detectors, and that's about it. Uh, not too many things can happen in the field of ion chromatography. As far as the detectors can go, we really only have one choice, and that's about it. And there's another choice out there that seems to become more and more popular due to just a few analysis methods that we can use ion chromatography for. So the very first detector that we can mention is the conductivity detector. What we're going to see is that conductivity is really universal with all ions. So for me, if I ordered an ion chromatography instrument from a manufacturer, they're just going to go ahead and assume that I need the conductivity detector. They're not going to ask any questions at all. Do you need the conductivity detector? Yes, that's the one that I need. So they're not going to even ask the question. Unless you specifically tell them that you need another type of the detector, it's going to come with conductivity. The way that this detector is made is that there's two electrodes, microelectrodes, that are inside of this box. And your eluent, or your flow path, will go across these microelectrodes, and the ions will create some conductivity. You know, the ions, like we've said all along, they're charged. They're positive or they're negative. And these charges give these microelectrodes a signal. So that readout is going to show positive on your chromatogram. And that's why we see peaks the way that we do in the IC world. The very best thing happens when your mobile phase is pretty much water out of the end. Because water typically carries a very small, insignificant conductivity as it travels across these microelectrodes. And the ions, if they're present, will be able to be picked out of the crowd. And the detector is going to read a positive signal for it. Uh, one of the things that you have to keep in mind is that temperature is going to play a role here. Uh, normally, everything is ran at room temperature. We don't really want to run anything that's kind of weird or wonky, meaning super cold right out of the refrigerator or super hot right out of the hot plate or water bath. So I know that some of the methods out there will use a column heater, and that column heater is traditionally heated to around 40 degrees in total. Uh, nothing really I've seen too much hotter than that. But you got to keep that in mind. A one degree temperature change, you see that on the very bottom of your screen, is going to be a 5% difference in conductivity. So the temperature is very important when it concerns the conductivity readout. So everything pretty much has to be ran at room temperature, not too hot, not too cold. It's the Goldilocks temperature here for ion chromatography. The next slide that you're going to see uh, is a couple of uh, ions, and these ions could be the anion or the cation side of the house. And what you're seeing is the traditional uh, semen centimeter square per mole of ion that's coming around. Uh, so molar ion conductivity is basically what this is. Uh, and as you can see, the fluoride, chloride, nitrate, sulfate, phosphate, chloride, chlorate, carbonate, or bicarbonate, and carbonate up on the top half of your screen, uh, those are traditionally pretty low when it concerns moles or molarity. So we're looking at, you know, 70s and 70s and 52s and 60s and 40s. There's a few on there that are pretty high. Uh, and that's okay, but we're looking at 40s and 50s per mole that's going to be present. Lithium, sodium, potassium, ammonium, magnesium, calcium, and zinc. Notice how they spelt zinc. I think that's kind of funny. Uh, but those are the cation side of the house. And if you look down below, lithium's going to be pretty tiny. Uh, but sodium, potassium, ammonium, magnesium, all of those uh, are a little bit higher off than the anion side of the house. What does this mean to you? Well, that means that if I ran lithium, sodium, potassium, and ammonium together, then lithium is probably going to be a very tiny peak. You know, if it's going to be there, it's going to be there. And then I can make standards, and those standards are basically going to give me a signal and a calibration curve. But overall, that lithium is going to be a little bit smaller in height than the other cations that I might be running. 
The same thing is going to happen up at the very top end of the anion side of the house, right? You look at chloride, and chloride is 52. Or you look at bicarb, and that's 44, which is one of the reasons that we like to use it, right? It carries very little conductivity. But if I look at chloride, chloride is probably going to give me a very tiny peak height. It's going to be there. I'm going to see it. But it's not going to be as large as the others. And that's where this difference is coming in. So if you're making a multi-mix standard and you're running that standard and chloride is through the roof, right, super, super high, and then the next ones that are right beside of it at the same concentration is much lower, well, that's the reason. The reason is how much conductivity they are carrying per concentration. So chloride could be through the roof and the nitrate, well if you made it at the same amount then these ppm amounts, then the peak height should be about the same. But if you looked at sulfate, sulfate's going to be a pretty large peak. It's either going to be very tall or it's going to be very fat and very wide. So those are one of the things that you got to look for. This is what's going to describe the reason that different peak heights are associated with the same concentration of different ions. So again, I can run fluoride and chloride, and I can make fluoride at a 50 ppm. I make a chloride at a 50 ppm. And those peaks are not going to be the same height. And the reason is because fluoride carries with it a lower conductivity than chloride does. So chloride is going to be a little bit taller or a little bit fatter compared to the fluoride peak. And that's why that happens. The same on the cation side of the house. All right. Uh, the reason I say this video series is going to be kind of short with the detectors is because here's your detector. And actually, there's no troubleshooting that you can do with this. Uh, the conductivity detector is meant as it's meant. Uh, this is the way that it comes. Uh, you can see the hookup in the very back end of the box. That just basically gets hooked up to your instrument or to your software. And then the tubing that you see in the front side of the conductivity, that is your mobile phase entrance. So your mobile phase is going to go into the detector through that piece of tubing. Uh, there's no maintenance here that you can do. Uh, they actually make it to be maintenance free, believe it or not. And when your detector goes out, then that pretty much means that you basically need a new detector. So you might as well just fork out the thousands of dollars that this detector is going to cost you because that's going to have to be replaced. There's nothing that you can do to clean it out. There's nothing that you can do to make it work. When it goes out, it is out, folks. That's all there is to it. So troubleshooting here is very easy. You don't do it. But troubleshooting here is going to be expensive because you're going to have to replace it if, in fact, there is something wrong with the detector unit. Uh, here is a picture of a lady using an ion chromatography instrument. If you can uh, notice, this instrument's a little bit bigger than ours in the lab. Uh, and up at the very top, you can see the place for the conductivity detector uh, or the detector unit. It might be conductivity, it might be something else, but that's where it's going to be located. Uh, it's very easily accessible because a lot of times you have to disconnect the tubing and maybe put new tubing on, uh, but you should not be doing any maintenance work at all to the detector itself. Uh, so it is meant to be front up, front and center. It's meant to put your hands on it, but never open the case, never take a screwdriver to it, never try to clean it out because it's not going to work, and you're probably going to do more damage than you actually do uh, anything positive to it. All right? So that's what we need to say about the conductivity detector, right? It works out of two electrodes. It constantly measures the conductivity coming across. We now know that different ions, and this is just a very short table of them, will carry with them different conductivity values. And as those ions are coming across, those conductivity values are getting analyzed and getting read. And you see that in form of a peak that shows up on your computer screen. Uh, you don't have to memorize any of these. You don't even really need to memorize which one is higher than the other. Uh, those are not questions that I'm going to ask on an exam. Uh, but uh, it is something kind of nice to know when you're back pocket, to, especially if someone asks you, well, why is one peak so much shorter than the other and they're at the same concentration? And now you know kind of how to explain that answer. All right. Uh, the other detector that we're going to look for is a UV-Vis detector. And a UV-Vis detector 
is basically the same UV Viz instrument that you've been using in the lab in the spectroscopy class, if you've taken that, or in some of our other classes, you've used the UV Viz instrument. Uh, that UV Viz instrument is playing off of color, and that's typically why we use it in ion chromatography. Uh, a lot of times we'll make samples, and those samples are colored samples, and those samples can be analyzed using a UV Viz detector at the end instead of a conductivity detector at the end. These are traditionally falling, though, in transition metals. So if you're working in the valley elements of the periodic table, these would be things like chromium especially. It seems like chromium is a very big metal that gets analyzed in an environmental laboratory. Chromium can be analyzed using ion chromatography, but the problem is that you have to have a colored solution, an indicator, to make chromium show up a little bit better. Uh, that requires a UV vis detector. So there could be a standalone IC instrument in the laboratory, and maybe that's all that instrument's going to be used for. It is a UV vis detector instead of a conductivity detector. So we can analyze these transition metals. Chromium is not the only one, but it typically is the most common one that's out there. And the whole purpose of this is that you will analyze a colored solution uh, and you, the chromatography side will separate the ions from each other while the UV is the detector and it does what it's always doing and that's measuring the concentration through the way the sample is absorbing the light. All right. The problem here is that reagents have to be used. Uh, it's not very uncommon to have what we call a post-derivatization which means that everything goes through the column first and they begin to separate. Chromium separates out from everything else. And then at the tail end of the column, before it goes into the detector, it goes through a reaction chamber or it goes through an addition of a reagent. And that is what makes it colored and that then goes into the detector. This is a way that we can make sure that that reagent is not reacting inside of the column and we're not gunking up the column and the column is separating like it's supposed to. So we add it at the end before it goes into the detector to keep everything on the front side a little bit cleaner. Uh, so that's what post-derivatization means. And if you read a method that talks about that, you now know what they're referring to. This is a spit it out of the column first, then we'll mix it with the reagent to make it colored, and then it goes into the UV vis detector in order to be picked up. Those are really the only two detectors that we have with ion chromatography, the UV vis and the uh, conductivity. Uh, I'm sure that, you know, later on in the future, there's going to be more and more common types of detectors that come along with these guys. But uh, quite honestly, these are the two most common ones that you're going to see. Uh, and anything else is just a specialized method that that particular laboratory might be using and might be working with. All right. Okay, so uh, that's what I'm going to say about the detectors in this video. You might have one more, and I'm going to show you a couple of images maybe uh, of, and schematics on the inside of the, the detector units, and we'll finish up IC uh, in that particular video.